Canta, canta, compañero, que tu voz sea disparo, que con las manos del pueblo no habrá canto. Dragi prieteni, suntem în hotelul Melia din Caracas, unde foarte mulți membri ai Congresului împotriva fascismului au venit din diferite țări ale lumii și alături de mine este domnul Costas Isikos din Grecia, care a fost adjunct al ministrului apărării în Grecia. Și avem plăcerea să discutăm cu dumnealui despre acest eveniment la care participăm și vom vorbi în continuare în engleză. So, Mr. Costas, uh, I understood that uh, we are representatives from uh, 95 countries and uh, we are in uh, total about uh, 1,200 uh, participants. That's correct. So, uh, it's an amazing event. Uh, it's a worldwide event. How would you describe this uh, event in Venezuela against fascist Congress? Yes. Well, I think that this is an international initiative taking place in Caracas. Caracas is very important because Caracas, recently in Venezuela, we had elections, presidential elections, uh, which were a worldwide uh, news war between the West and the rest of the world, which is not subjugated by uh, the Western media, Washington media, European Union media. And of course, uh, fascism, fascism, fascism has made an appearance in Venezuela. Uh, it's been here for decades, but now it's resurging. And we have had even uh, 27 people who were assassinated two or three days after the elections, just because they were supporting Nicolás Maduro and uh, uh, the United Socialist uh, Venezuelan Party. Yes, actually at the event when we participate, Mr. Maduro came and he gave some examples uh, regarding the radicalism that was created in uh, this uh, society in Venezuela. And uh, I think it's worth to mention that uh, uh, a woman, leader of political party, has been killed by a young boy of 13 years old because old, because he read on TikTok that uh, we need to kill uh, Chavez. This is shocking. This is shocking because we see the connection of fascism through the new technologies, through the media, so social networks, where a 13-year-old boy is indoctrinated into becoming a killer. And he killed this lady who was just a leader of the community, helping uh, uh, people who are marginalized socially, a uh, leader of her party, governing party, and she was brutally killed. Now this 13-year-old boy, of course, was apprehended immediately, but through special psychologists, because he's underage, he's a young boy, yes. and he must be treated socially, psychiatrically, and psychologically. Is not just any ordinary criminal, we should say. And at the same time, President Maduro mentioned that there was a, a, a recent law in Great Britain stating that 15-year-old delinquents should be put in jails with adults, not with their people in their own age. So we see this difference. And the West talks about a dictatorship. The West talks about the no freedom, yes. no social care. And we see this even taking place of a young boy who was indoctrinated by fascism. And Mr. Maduro made a very eloquent example of how the European Union is integrating itself into fascist type of behavior, even against younger people who are committing crimes. Yeah. Um, it's uh, important to add here in this context that the uh, European Union, together with the uh, United States, they did not recognize the result of the elections in Venezuela that took place in 28th of July this year. And uh, they considered that the opponent of uh, President Maduro actually won. But, of course, it's a lie because the Supreme Court of Venezuela admitted that Mr. Maduro uh, 
won. And nine of his ten opponents admitted that he was the winner. Only the one who fled the country recently, a few days ago, Mr. Edmundo Gonzalez Urrutia, who was offered asylum, political asylum in Spain, is the only one that says, I won. Even the other nine opponents of President Maduro, who are very fierce opponents, belonging to other ideological and political parties, adversaries to the governing party, have admitted that Mr. Maduro is the yeah, winner. Actually, the electoral system in Venezuela is uh, well known as being extremely efficient. I mean, yes. you cannot fraud this uh, system. It, there are parallel uh, uh, ways of uh, counting the votes, yes. and uh, it's very hard. But still, um, the representatives of the European Union and the United States refuse to participate in monitorizing the elections, and after that they said, oh, we know that the, the There were more than 2,000... There were more than 2,000 observers, electoral observers, invited in Venezuela, not only by the governing party, but the opposition parties, who invited their brother and sister parties in the Christian democracy or in the extreme right wing in the European Union and other countries, and they did not participate. So one can make conclusions yeah. of before and after uh, what happened. It's obvious if you think, if you have critical thinking, but uh, as we know... Critical the, thinking is disappearing. Yeah, <laughs> the um, Western system, uh, I mean uh, United States and European Union, they are using narratives that keep repeating in order to hypnotize population. And uh, population who does not have critical thinking, they um, start to accept this narrative as being the truth. It's because with, when, you, when you speak half the truth, it's actually a lie. There is no uh, phrase that it can be um, changing the meaning of truth. You either tell the truth as a whole, yes. or you better not tell it at all. It is the same story with Corina Machado, who is actually the big leader of the opposition. She was not allowed to participate in the elections. And when we hear it in the Western news that the decision of the courts in Venezuela prohibited uh, her becoming uh, an electoral uh, candidate for the presidency, we hear this in the West and we say, oh, this doesn't sound maybe good. It's really dictatorship. Yeah, maybe this is. But nobody told us that the decision of the court was taken while she was a member of the parliament in the opposition. She participated in a meeting, an international meeting of the Organization of American States, where Cuba and Venezuela are not allowed to participate. And uh, she went to this meeting representing Panama. Another state. Another state, and she's a, she's a member of the Venezuelan parliament. Can you imagine if in my country, in Greece, I am invited to an international meeting mm -hmm. and I represent uh, Romania? And if you are in the Romanian parliament, you go to an international meeting and you represent Greece. These things does not happen you in international... You avoid it. Yes, you, this is not international diplomacy. Absolutely. This is international piracy. And she's... She has been uh, indicted for this. So she was, the decision of the uh, Venezuelan government was uh, justified. Of course, she uh, overcame and overruled the uh, conduct of uh, any parliamentarian in the Venezuelan parliament. Mm -hmm. And um, you told us uh, a bit earlier that uh, today or yesterday, uh, Venezuela took a decision to set a part of uh, Spain because of. Yes, uh, the National Parliament of Venezuela, while well, we are here in Caracas, just last night uh, had a, a decision taken uh, to cut uh, complete diplomatic and economic and commercial ties with Spain. Mm -hmm. Why? Because Spain, while they received and gave asylum to the main opponent of Nicolas Maduro, Edmundo González Urrutia, at the same time they did not recognize the legal presidency and the legal election. Of President Maduro. So it is uh, what I'm giving you as an information is just what you asked me before. The European Union does not send observers to the elections. After the elections, they keep their distance. And now they say we reckon, we don't recognize Maduro. I mean, yes, because the elections were fraud. Yes, Probably. this is not such an innocent, innocent fairy it's tale. A it's a narrative, and a very well planned narrative. 
and it's not told to the European public. It's not told directly. They did the same um, six years ago with the one way door. The same recipes. One way door is the copy paste uh, of of. of Buruti has the copy paste of yes. Guaido yeah. a few years ago, and Guaido now has disappeared from the political scene. He's in the United States, and he's being indicted, indicted in the United States for fraud and money laundering mm -hmm. by the United States. So, how many people know this? Yeah, because people in uh, our countries, in Greece, in Romania, they follow the, only the mainstream media, especially. And uh, they're brainwashed. Yeah. Brainwashing is uh, unfortunately uh, a trend. And uh, you're a journalist, but uh, in today's brainwashing, uh, journalists uh, do not make investigative journalism. And uh, you're losing your jobs because of influencers. Yeah, but here in... Uh, and they cannot replace you, of in course. In Venezuela, at this Congress, we offer another perspective. Uh, a real one, and that's why I invite many people to talk in order to bring to you, our audience, um, another point of view. Because if we follow only mainstream media, we uh, start, uh, we um, uh, gain to become a brainwashed, as I said. But, Mr. Costas, I want to ask you something else regarding Greece. Which is the situation of Greece uh, present days? Because uh, we know in Romania that Greece has been subjected to some uh, exploitation of the European Union. And uh, you were in a very bad economic situation. Well, the European Union, along with Washington and the early 90s destroyed an entity in Europe called Yugoslavia. Yes. They destroyed it. Um, and of course, uh, this was a brutal war, an unjust war, destroying a country. Now, Greece became a victim of an economic war, which is almost the same. Of course, we do not have people killed by bombs, but we had the highest rate of suicides in the European Union during the years of the economic uh, packages of the IMF and the Troika. Uh, we're still suffering from that. Macedonia is pretty the same. So you understand that uh, our countries, Balkan countries, Eastern countries in Europe, uh, we are third category citizens in Europe. This is unfortunately a, a German Europe, or a Franco-German Europe, better said. And I think that um, our people, from their historic, historical experience, know that when somebody knocks the door on your home and says, we offer a free meal for you, or a free help, they want something in return. And usually they take your home. You get a meal, but they take your home. So the parallel is that they want to take our countries, they want to take our youth, they want to brainwash them, they want to take anything that could produce for our people. One of the this first, is robbery. One of the first steps that they are doing is to capture the leadership of the country. In Romania they succeeded after the coup d'etat in 1989. They um, put leaders formed by Soros uh, institutes and uh, now Romania is captive to this uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, interests. Well, how, how about Greece? I think in Greece and in Romania and many, many other European Union countries, political leaders are fabricated in um, me mediatic centers. Yes. Uh, they don't talk a lot about politics. Uh, they talk a lot more about what they like to eat, where they like to go for holidays, or with our favorite football team is, uh, and less politics. So less programs, less social programs for the people. And this is um, a new laboratory in Europe, in the European Union. We are the most advanced laboratory, socio-economic and political laboratory of fascism of the 21st century. Right now it's disguised. It doesn't present itself as a hereditary movement of Mussolini and Hitler. Of course it's not. But its strategic goals and its methods are very, very simple.
anymore. But the leadership of Greece, how is orientated now? I mean, do they have still a nationalist orientation or they are totally obeying? Greece is losing its independence and it's lost its independence in independent country. It's a NATO member country, like Romania. Yeah. Uh, you are going to have the biggest military uh, NATO base, yes. US base in and all of Europe. You also have yes, you have a lot of NATO bases. We have 15 military. 15 facilities. Uh, the Alexandroupolis port in northern Greece is the vertical corridor between the uh, military help and military uh, aid that is given to Ukraine today and it's going north up the way to the Baltic countries. So this is a preparation for future aggression and future conflicts in Eastern Europe. We must be aware of this. The multiplication of military bases in our countries is a danger of losing the oxygen we breathe. So it's a political suicide for our countries to become NATO colonies. They are actually occupation troops. Yes, and as occupation troops, they need to have bars, they need to have friendly women and friendly men, and they need to become the Cuba of the 50s. And we do not want to become the Cuba of the 50s. We want to have the, 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 our people to be proud of what they are and what they will conquer in the future for themselves and for their children and grandchildren. Happy lives, full of peace and cooperation and collaboration among all peoples. Trend is growing. It's it's growing. It's a growing need of humanity to have balance, to have harmony, to be away from war and away from um, conflicts that bring death and destruction. We, we need an alternative because dollar, the sanctions, everything became a tool of hegemony. That's correct. And now it's being lost, and they're replacing their hegemony of the currency and the dollar with the hegemony of the social. Um, contacts through the internet, through the three big oligarchs of the world, Elon Musk, uh, Zuckerberg, and Jeff Bezos. Yes. They're portrayed as the saviors of humanity. And what they want is they portray that the future is us, the few, the ones the mind. to control the mind, the present, the past, and the future of, the hum of yes. humanity. And we must stand against this. They create narratives. We can see with this climate change, with the pandemics, worse. Uh, I think I think they will use anything in their power. Uh, I will give an example that was said, and it's not my words. I, I, I don't want to steal someone's very intelligent phrase, which was given by uh, Jorge Rodriguez, the president of the parliament. He said 40 years ago, if a, 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 a conspiracy theorist said that the earth was flat, he would probably be attended in a psychiatric hospital to be given help. Now we have millions of followers believing that the earth is flat. And we who believe that the world is round, we sometimes might become a minority. This is the world that you're trying to create. And uh, 50 years ago, a British comedian said, uh, um, 100 years ago, if you were uh, uh, homosexual, uh, you would be hanged. Um, 20 years ago, if you were homosexual, you would be put in jail, punished, fined. Uh, uh, now I am leaving the country. Why? Uh, someone asked. Because I am afraid to become mandatory. So this is what we live now, actually. The, 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 the ruling classes, the oligarchs of the world, the, the world influencers, which are their uh, robots and their uh, mouths in the social media, are trying to portray the world very differently than what it is today. I was in Africa many years ago, and uh, I was asked by an African school child in Central Africa, what is a vegan? And uh, I, I tried to explain him that uh, vegan is a, a trend, a modern trend, of, 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 of which for me is acceptable. Anybody can eat whatever they think is right for them. But it's not right to be mandatory to be a vegan because you have to be a vegan. You can be a vegan if you choose to be a vegan. But he told me, you know why we don't have vegans? 
in, in Africa and in my country because we cannot even have a glass of milk per day. We don't have a choice. Mr. Costas, one final question. As an uh, expert in military, how do you see the conflict uh, that is developing in Ukraine? And also a short reference on uh, Gaza. Well, uh, the conflict in, in Europe, in the heart of Europe, is a conflict between NATO and the Russian Federation. It's not a conflict between Ukraine and Russia. I want to be clear on this. This was a planned war since 2014, since the Maidan uh, so-called revolution, which was actually um, uh, a military coup uh, against a uh, legal elected president, uh, Yanukovych. And uh, this war uh, has been continuing against Russia. It was an economic war, it was a sanctions war, it was an oil war, an energetic war, and now it's a real uh, conflict uh, where millions, of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives are being lost. NATO wants to play all of our cards to destroy the Russian Federation. But, you know, when you say I want to destroy a Russian Federation, it seems they don't know a lot about history of the Russian people. You know, the Red Army, Berlin, Napoleon. <laughs> Napoleon. And now uh, uh, the NATO troops and Ukraine. I'm not saying Ukraine and the NATO troops. The NATO commanders, yeah, of course. The NATO commanders and Ukraine. And, uh, Yugoslavia, okay, they succeeded in destroying the country, but the Russian Federation is not Yugoslavia, it's not Greece, it's not Russia. It's a world nuclear power. And the Russians are very, very keen in keeping their independence and keeping their national integrity. Whether we like the Russian government or whether we don't like yes. it, all people have a right to defend their country. And this is what the Russian Federation is doing. Especially after uh, 2000, yeah. when uh, Putin came to power, the Ru uh, Russian Federation became very nationalist because under Gorbachev and Eltsin, the situation was... Yes, uh, they were obeyed the it's a country. It's a country that wants to have independence from the Germany of the United States. And the United States fully, very clearly says, you know, the, the struggle between Kamala Harris and Trump uh, in their debates or their differences in their tactics, not their strategy, is who is the worst enemy? Uh, Mr. Um, Trump says China. Mrs. Harris says Russia. They don't really disagree. They want to destroy both. They, they both. just disagree yes. on how to do it and who to do it with first. This is their differences. Okay, and a few words about Gaza. Gaza is the repetition of the genocide of the Second World War by Nazis. Uh, not only against Jews, because sometimes we're told that the Holocaust uh, is only a Holocaust against Jews, which it was. But we had a Holocaust in Latin America uh, by the Spanish and the Portuguese and the British from North America to Latin America with tens of millions of indigenous people being assassinated. We had a Holocaust in the Belgian Congo with 8 million Africans being killed by King Leopold, who conquered the Congo. Western colonialists, American imperialism, European imperialism, and colonialism have a long line of holocausts. And unfortunately, Gaza is a new holocaust against the Palestinians. And all humanity, regardless of what your ideological and political choices are, is to think as human beings first, and then react to what this barbarity is being committed against yes. the Palestinians. But the international organizations uh, should maintain human rights. Uh, it seems to fail because, for instance, United uh, UN, United Nations, uh, they offered many resolutions on criticizing Israel, but still they did not manage to solve the problem. I agree with you. The United Nations has been completely marginalized. The International Court of Hague uh, for uh, against uh, crimes uh, against humanity has indicted Netanyahu and many many military leaders of Israel. And the president of the uh, Court of Hague said, "I am being bullied by Israel and Western countries not to implement this uh, this indictment uh, for against Netanyahu." So you see that all international organizations, whether it's the Hague or uh, uh, the United Nations and others are completely sidelined, completely marginalized. Only what Washington says and their puppy 
their Kanish Dalgam, as we say in Greece, the European Union, which has lost any sense of European independence and European self criticism and European European humanity because we had two world wars in Europe but we also had many philosophers in Europe. We had many thinkers for humanity. We must carry on our tradition of being a human race in Europe, in the European Union. We have become unfortunately the watchdogs of Washington militarily, economically and politically. Yeah. Let's hope the situation will change. We have to do that, there is no other choice. With this kind of congresses, we change mentality, we bring the message to our people. This congress in Caracas, which is the first congress against uh, fascism, imperialism and colonialism, will not be the last. There will be others. And we must grow and uh, take part in this congress, bringing our experiences from our own countries. And what President Maduro said yesterday, to create a new international against fascism. Yes. This is a necessity for the survival of humanity. To be united. Yes. To work together. Of course. Mr. Costas, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And my best to the Romanian people, because in the Balkans we're family, and we must think as a family. Thank you.